All right, so welcome everyone to our last 2021 Lunch and Learn series, which is our Ask the Experts panel. Um, again, our um, Lunch and Learn series is hosted by the Friends of Birmingham Botanical Gardens, and it's um, presented in partnership with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System, the Alabama Green Industry Training Center, the Jefferson County Department of Health, Jefferson County Commission, City of Leeds, Alabama, City of Birmingham Stormwater Management, and the Stormwater Management Authority Incorporated. And our panel today actually has a lot of our partners sitting on it to um, answer all of your gardening and home landscape questions. And so I'm going to give you a little brief bio about everyone here. The first person we have is Brooke McMinn, who is the Director of Education and Visitor Experience here at Friends of Birmingham Botanical Gardens. Did I get that right, Brooke? Okay. Um, so Brooke, specialties are medicinal and economic botany, ethnobotany, sustainable agriculture, and conservation. In 2014, following several years with the Rutgers University Extension in New Jersey Agriculture Experiment, Experiment Station as a horticultural agent, Master Gardener Program Coordinator and Plant Breeding Researcher, she, re she returned to Birmingham, Alabama and started with the Friends of Birmingham Botanical Garden as our Plant Adventures Program Specialist. Um, she worked to share the wonders of the gardens and nature with undeserved communities before transitioning to her current role in 2018. Um, as the Friends Director of Education and Visitor Experience, she designs and delivers educational programs and garden experiences to better connect the greater Birmingham community to the plants that power their lives. Brooke has been a member of the Environmental Education Association of Alabama since 2014 and has served on the board of directors for the organization since 2018 and is currently the board president. Our second panelist that I'm going to introduce is Molly Hendry, and she joined the Friends of Birmingham Botanical Garden staff in the newly created role of Garden Assessment Project Leader in 2017. A primary objective of her work is facilitating a comprehensive review of the more than two dozen individual gardens that are featured in the 67 and a half acre property. And she is also a key player in supporting the renewal of the garden's master plan. In addition to supporting design development and review of, of, of ongoing garden products, projects, sorry. <laughs> Molly holds a BS in horticulture and masters in landscape architecture from Auburn University. She's a native to Birmingham, but um, Molly has worked at Win Winterthur Garden in Delaware, as well as several gardens across England and Scotland as the Royal Horticultural Society's Interchange Fellow before returning home to Birmingham to start her job here. Our third panelist is Dr. Jim Jacoby. He's employed with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System as an extension plant pathologist. He has a BS in forestry from the University of Vermont, an MS in forest pathology from Clemson, Clemson University, and a PhD in plant pathology from Auburn University. He has over 30 years experience solving insect and disease problems of trees and shrubs, turf grass, vegetables, and field crops. For the last 20 years, he has managed the plant diagnostic lab at the Birmingham Botanical Gardens. Prior, prior to working for Alabama Extension, he held positions as an IPM specialist field development representative as a research associate at Auburn University. Our fourth panel, panelist is Bethany O'Rear, who is a regional agent in home grounds and commercial horticulture with Alabama Extension. She delivers educational programming and, consult, and consulting to promote smarter landscapes in Alabama. The primary goal of the Home Grounds team is to help consumers preserve Alabama's natural resources, creating better landscapes for better living. And Bethany is actually over our Jefferson County Master Gardeners um, program. John Neighbors is currently employed as Alabama Extension's Green Industry Training Coordinator and serves as the Alabama Green Industry Training Center's Executive Director since 2013. The Alabama Green Industry Training Center Incorporated was founded in 2006 as a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and its mission is to help educate professional students and homeowners to become better stewards of their environment through technical training on pesticide safety and use. Um, 
OSHA general industry training and defensive driver training. The center also works to promote the industry to, to young people at high school career days and regional workforce, work, uh, workforce development events held across Alabama. John has a degree in horticulture from Auburn University, along with the ornamental and turf pest control supervisory cert certification. Setting a landscape certification and landscape design certification from the Alabama Department of Agriculture. Um, he's an instructor for the National Safety Council's Defense Driving 4-Hour Course and is an authorized OSHA trainer for general industry. In addition, he holds the Alabama Certified Landscape Professional Credential, along with winning landscape management awards from the Alabama Nursery and Landscape Association for outstanding landscape management at Caraway Hospital and Birmingham Southern College. Um, John's prior experience includes 15 years with a large landscape firm in Birmingham, Alabama, managing on-site crews, floor culture department, safety program, fleet management, and business administration. In addition, he has five years of experience in the wholesale production and retail sales for greenhouse, nursery, and garden center sectors. And our newest extension agent who's joined us today is Tyler Mason. He's an urban regional extension agent for the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. He is responsible for urban agriculture and natural resource management in Jefferson County and Tuscaloosa counties. He has a bachelor's degree in agricultural education from Purdue University, a master's in extension education and a PhD in horticulture from Colorado State University. He is most passionate about sustainable vegetable production and preserving natural resources. And you've probably seen Tyler a lot this year because he joined our um, Lunch and Learn board and he led a Lunch and Learn and he's been introducing a lot of our speakers. And you also probably seen John a lot this year because he's been introducing a few of our speakers. Um, so we are going to jump into some questions that we got um, via email and also from some of your surveys. And the first question we have is, I had some large black spots to appear on most of the leaves of my zinnias. I did not take a picture and I have thrown them away and planted some mums. Is it possible that some spray application from my lawn service may have drifted over to the zinnias or is this the season for their growth to end? I can take that one. So, um, Zinnias get at least three different leaf spots. Two of them are caused by fungi and they make round, big round spots, typically with kind of a darker halo around it. Um, they also get a bacterial leaf spot, which the spots will be more angular or kind of square spots and they'll start low in the plant. I really don't think from your description that it was the lawn service spray. Um, zinnias will, during the wet, wet season that we had, um, zinnia diseases are super common. Probably the most common has been the bacterial leaf spot because that can be um, carried on the seed. So it often starts on small, small plants right after they're, they're seeded. And um, so it, it, and the good thing is that the diseases on the zinnias won't transfer over to your mums. So may, if you clean them all out, you should be okay with going back next season with some more zinnias. And, um, you know, if we don't have a monsoon season again, it should be okay. Yeah, Jim, I would I'd probably add too on the lawn service comment. If, if it was a uh, impact from some type of overspray, it would be more detrimental to the plants, most likely. They would. Yeah, and you might, exactly, John, and you might actually see it on a couple different plants, surrounding plants around the turf area. That's actually been, I've had at least, three or four samples come in in the last month of bedding plants that have had severe disease and the, the client thought it was, was a spray from the lawn service, when in every case it turned out to be just a product of all the wet weather and, and just some severe disease conditions, so. Yeah, my, my experience of that, it, it wipes out the entire planting, whether it's somebody didn't clean out a tank good enough or if it's drift or something like that, so yeah. And it often happens really quick, although disease can happen quick too. That's true. Wet weather, yeah. Yep. Is white powdery mildew a problem now because of the humidity? I had problems with this on my squash plant. I purchased some spray, but the mildew returned. 
You know, powdery mildew has been common since back in May, and it's it's a product it'll that fungus just with high relative humidity, the spores can absorb moisture and germinate on the leaves and cause disease. We don't even have to have the rainy condition like we had. So powdery mildew. Um, so it, it's and squash is one of the most common things that that gets affected by powdery mildew. Um, a couple things to reduce it next year is make sure you're planting in open sunny areas, good air circulation. But if you have a little bit of shade, especially in a vegetable garden, you're gonna have more powdery mildew. Um, another thing also to do is to make sure that um, over the winter time, check out your seed catalogs, look for some resistant varieties because that's an easy way to, to get control of some of these common things, especially on all the, all the cucurbits. So all your squash, zucchini, um, cucumbers, um, you know, all those things, powdery mildew is a really common thing for us to have. And then if, if you get some disease, choose the best spray possible. And the one thing about spraying is for a disease is that oftentimes it's not a one and done thing. You spray in according to the label directions, you may need, need to come back in seven to 14 days and spray again, and then continue that. Um, one thing on, on things like squash, is that powdery mildew often is, you notice it first on the bottom of the leaf. So look on the bottom and the top of the leaf and um, spray early if you need it. But I would go with a resistant you know, variety next year. I think that'd be a great thing to do. Matt, I might add one more thing. Uh, what it Sprays won't fix what's already been done, right? Uh, Jim, what, once it's there, it's... It's there, it just it functions out. Yeah, if you've waited a long time and the, the leaves are coated with this powdery, you know, with powdery mildew, it's really too late. Um, when you spray a fungicide, don't necessarily worry about the leaves that are white. What you're looking for is that the new leaves that emerge are staying clean, that you're protecting, because fungicides are really aren't, they're not gonna eradicate the disease. They're protecting that new growth from getting sick. So you can even go in there and take some of the, a few of the lower leaves, you could prune those off and cut those leaves off um, and, and really focus on the new growth. My knockout rose bush has some yellow leaves on it. Is this coming and what could be the cause? I'll, I'll save Jim from having to jump in on a third there. <laughs> saying, um, it looks like the, the person that um, sent this in mentioned that they're also getting a lot of rain. Surprise, surprise, we all are lately. So uh, I think that's going to be something common that we're going to see on a lot of plants is just a little bit of yellowing, especially on older leaves. Um, and knockout roses are certainly not immune to having problems from just being inundated with too much rain. So uh, I'd, I'd say keep an eye out for anything beyond yellowing if it starts to progress to any other uh, disease signs or symptoms. If you start seeing spots or fuzzy bits and checking the top and the bottom of the leaf, like Jim mentioned as well. So you're making sure you're keeping an eye out for everything. Uh, but I think we're probably just going to see a lot of that. I have some vincas planted in my front yard. How long would they be in bloom? They also have some yellow leaves, but I think it is because of the rain we have beginning in the area. Yeah, vincas equals no water. <laughs> they love to be extra dry. So I, I, all the rain that we've had this year uh, really has a, a cause an issue with that uh, across the board. Dry, dry loving plant. They like to dry out between water. So hard to do this year. Would y'all suggest that someone move them inside if they're not planted in the ground? I would suspect they're probably planted in the ground. If not, if they're in containers, making sure that the containers are well drained would be really all, all you need to do for the most part there. And, and to the other part of her question about how long will they flower, um, I'm assuming she's talking about vinca major. That's that's our most common vinca in a garden around here. But uh, generally, uh, till about now, <laughs> we'll, we'll see it usually through spring, through um, through the summer, depending on the, the the type of summer we have. So with it's already starting to cool off a little bit, I wouldn't be surprised if that stops pretty soon. I might add too, Brooke, uh, on if you got if it's with so much rain and you have an irrigation system. Make sure either the rain sensor is functioning uh, and properly set. And if you don't have one, maybe have to step up monitoring the automatic controller. Go out, turn some, turn it off, and let it let things dry out. 
that's good for your entire landscape and a lot of these problems across the board a lot of times, particularly with some of the rain. That's a great point, John. I can't tell you how many neighborhoods I drive through when it's raining and I see sprinklers just still out there going. So definitely check those. I think these next few are for Bethany. Um, I purchased some collard plants and put them in some paint buckets. When would be the best time to put them outside? And also, do they do well in containers? Okay, so first, I would um, wonder, um, <clears throat> I'm sure the, the bucket's cleaned out, and I would assume they're made in a five-gallon bucket. If it's smaller than that, um, then you're probably going to need to transplant those into a bigger bucket. They're going to need a little more soil volume than that. Um, but, you know, if you're reusing or repurposing buckets, you want to make sure that you get out any kind of harmful, I mean, if there's any paint residual in there at all, um, so that can be an issue. So we want to make sure that they're clean. But if we're just talking about five gallon buckets, uh, yeah, they do great in containers. Um, you know, collards are going to be your leafy vegetables. Um, so you can harvest those. The, now is the time of year to plant those and, and contain, there are a lot of um, fall and winter veggies that do great in containers. Uh, even if you think about carrots, um, they'll do fine as long as they have enough soil volume. So if you want to plant those in a five gallon bucket or a, a container that has um, some um, depth that works out good. And there are also varieties that you can look for that are kind of container centric. So um, patio varieties, things that are going to grow smaller. Um, there are some carrots that actually are, um, and this is not a technical horticulture term, but are squattier in their fruit production. So they don't grow as long um, and they do great in containers. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good time to get those in either in the ground or in the pots. Um, there should be a lot of transplants available at your local uh, local retail garden center, as well as seed varieties. So um, get out there and get planting. I have a small patio tomato plant outside in a paint bucket. It has produced a few tomatoes, but not a lot. The blooms would come, but no tomato will produce for now. I have two new ones coming out. When is the time for their production to end? That will depend on the actual um, cultivar or selection that they planted. There are some um, tomatoes that take longer to produce. Um, some are produced in a shorter window. So that's, that's gonna vary. As far as the blooms go, um, if there's only a couple, I wonder about how much sun they're getting. So that could be an issue. Um, also, these cooler temperatures are not going to do them any favors as far as um, future production um, because uh, nighttime temperatures really affect tomato um, production. So that's going to be an issue. So there, it sounds like there may be a combination of things. I also wonder about how much um, fertilizer they have given, especially nitrogen. A lot of nitrogen will promote green leafy growth, but not as much fruit set. So it could be um, several different things going on. Um, and as far as how long they're going to produce, once again, depending on which cultivar, but these nighttime temperatures are going to wrap that up pretty quickly, I would say. I also planted some Brussels sprouts in a container bed yesterday, which was September 17th, 21st, when we got this question. Do they do well in containers? Yes, they will do fine in containers as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, lots of our um, fall, winter veggies do good in containers because they just don't take up quite as much room as say like a cucumber or a squash. So um, containers make a good option for getting those cold crops planted. So this next one is a, a bit long. Um, we would like a recommendation for a, decid a deciduous tree to shade the front of our house. The front is now fully, ex fully exposed to sun for six plus hours in the hot months. This fall, we would like to plant a fairly fast growing tree to shade the front. We will probably, probably move three to eight years from now. The tree will be 30 to 45 feet from the house placed in a rough corner form by the driveway in the street. The minimum distance to the driveway will be eight feet into the street 13. We are also looking for a lower growing tree to replace a diseased dogwood that is in the front, the front of, of the yard and closer to the house. It will eventually be under the canopy of the larger tree if it has a wider spread. Okay, 
Yeah, I think I think I'm jumping in on this one. Um, first off, I commend you for planting a tree. I definitely want you to get a tree planted in your yard there. Um, I will say uh, expecting to benefit from the shade in the short duration that it sounds like they're going to be in this home uh, might not be incredibly realistic. Uh, even our faster growing trees do need some good time to establish. Uh, but here in Alabama, I my favorite tree to recommend for something like this is always an oak of some sort. So we've got, there are 90 different species of oaks out there and we can grow at least 40 of them here in Alabama. So uh, I love to encourage people to take advantage of the wide variety of oaks that we have available. And you can do a little research online to see, you know, which ones you like the look of and look at their specific shape and leaf color and things like that to determine what you might like. But there are some that are gonna establish a little more quickly than others. And those are gonna be probably in your red oak group and your white oak group. Uh, but still, you, you're not gonna wanna expect more than about two feet of growth a year, um, even in those faster growing trees, maybe, maybe a little bit more sometimes if you're really lucky. So looking at maybe um, 12 to 15 feet in those those first 10 to 12 years of it. So um, one thing they could do to help uh, advance that, of course, would be to plant a more mature tree. So you can buy more mature trees. Um, sometimes those uh, are uh, a little more beneficial because you do get that, that quicker growth out of them. Um, and they can be a little more durable when you when you first put them in the ground, but that doesn't mean you can plant them and neglect them. You still want to keep a close eye on them for those first couple of years, uh, making sure that you give them plenty of room around their root ball to grow uh, and expand. And, and you really ideally want about a 40 by 40 space for, for a tree that size, for a good shade tree, so about 1,600 square feet. So it sounds like the space that they have may be um, just about big enough for that. I'd be care cautious of putting it too close to that corner they mentioned, um, getting it too close to the sidewalk or too close to the driveway where those roots are going to hit a barrier. And as those roots underdevelop on one side of the tree, they're going to start to overdevelop on the other. And you can start to have an unstable tree, especially for a tree that size, if it's close to the home or other property, when later storms, it may come down. So give it as much even room around all the sides as you can. Um, and look at some of our native species of oak. For the red, I would suggest like overcup or swamp chestnut oak. I mean, for the white, sorry. Um, or the American white, the Quercus alba, that's one of my favorite trees. It's great for biodiversity, hosts a ton of other wildlife. Uh, but we've got some great red oaks too. The willow, uh, if you've got a particularly wet area especially. Uh, the schumards are great. The nuttalls or the scarlets. Or even some more of our obscure oaks in Birmingham, like our sandpost oaks, if you've got a really dry, sandy uh, type of, of turf there. So um, those, those are my two cents. Anybody else may want to add something different? I might. Well, Molly, go ahead. Where are you going? Oh, I was going to speak to the smaller tree that they asked about that would maybe come up under the shade of the larger tree. Um, there's a bunch of wonderful native trees that you can plant if um, that's something that you're looking for. I love um, service berries, great ones. You get flowers, you get berries, and you get fall color, and you can get beautiful multi trunk. Um, specimens of those. Um, our native fringe tree is another great one. Um, and then if you're not necessarily looking for native, but just a beautiful tree, we have these evergreen dogwoods in our sort of living garden at the gardens and they bloom kind of when all the other dogwoods have finished and they hold their blooms for a month and a half um, and they're evergreen. So that's another great choice as well. I get, my comment, I guess, was going to be on mechanics. So number one thing on tree is don't plant it too deep in the ground. So uh, re research that. On, if you're planting it yourself, make sure you reach out to Extension. Um, Aces.edu can help you with uh, some publications on that. Or, or search the web. Uh, find a good, reputable source on that. But uh, definitely nothing around the trunk of the tree. No string, twine, or any kind of webbing left and don't plant it too deep. That's two of the uh, major uh, foul ups on that. I'll throw don't volcano mulch it on top of that too. Definitely mulch it once you get it in the ground, but give some space around that trunk flare uh, that you want to make sure you see above the soil line and don't bring that mulch right up to the trunk. That's basically the same thing as burying it too deep. And a great trick when you're planting a tree 
is if you have like a bamboo cane or some kind of yard stick or something, when you dig the hole, if you set that across it, you can see where ground level is when you set the tree in there. And you can, you want that root flare to be right above level ground. So sometimes it's hard to tell when you have, when you dug a really big, nice, beautiful hole to see where ground level is really gonna be. And then once you put all soil back in there, you're not gonna wanna take it back out and shift the tree. So that's a good little life hack. Our next question is about wild onions in St. Augustine grass. So the person has been digging them by hand for years, but it hasn't been able to eradicate the wild onions. Um, they've used pre-emergent recommended by Classic Gardens in the fall, which keeps out all the other unwanted weeds, but doesn't make a dent in the onions. Um, I've been told that anything that would kill onions will also kill the grass. So they just really want a solution. I go ahead and, and jump on that one too, I guess. Uh, so there are no pre-emergents that are effective against wild onion or, or wild garlic. Um, Jim, when we were discussing this earlier, Jim said it's probably wild garlic. We see that a little more commonly around here. Um, but, uh, you know, digging is, is really the only mechanical option you have to go get them out of the ground. Uh, so other than that, your option is really to spray treat it. And it is true that anything you spray on that onion that's gonna be effective against it is probably gonna kill any turf that you also get it on. So you don't wanna take it out and, and make a wide application unless you have, you know, 60, 70% of your turf grass is now um, garlic instead or onion instead of turf. Uh, if you just have some spots, you may just need to go in and spot treat. And there are a few products that you can use. You can use um, uh, products that are made for nut sedge, have shown some effectiveness, I believe, against onion and garlic. Um, the, the problem is you get those round, waxy, skinny, narrow leaves on those uh, garlic and onion plants and the, the stuff just doesn't really want to stick to them. So you got to use something pretty strong. And then your broadleaf herbicides um, will also uh, be pretty effective, uh, 2,4-D and that type of thing. Um, but once again, it's got to be a spot treatment and any turf or anything else that you get those on around it uh, are likely to be affected by something that's going to take those out. So you just got to be really careful. And once you apply it too, uh, make sure you don't just like apply it and come back and mow it. Give the chance of uh, the plant a chance to uptake that poison through its leaves. And you may have to apply it a few times, especially if you're using some of those uh, more broadleaf uh, applications. It, it may have to get it in the fall and then come back again in the winter and get it again. I would say in the St. Augustine, you want to be really careful not to apply anything to it when it's um, in its greening up period, what we call it in the spring. So when it's starting to, to spring back to life, just, just go in by hand and dig out what you can for the onions and then come back in the fall and the winter and spray them again because you can really damage your turf if you spray it during that time. Jim, John, Bethany, Tyler, anything else? You know, one one herbicide that that is pretty effective and generally safe for St. Augustine. But you, again, you're just 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 like Brooke said, spot spray only. Um, but um, Amazaquin, which is image image kills uh, nutgrass, um, that one's good on on uh, wild garlic and wild onions and um, should be safe. But follow the the label instructions to the letter, um, and and definitely. If we, during that period of either going into dormancy or coming out of dormancy, be careful and, and avoid those conditions. Um, but that's that's probably the best. Um, suggestions for what natives to plant under full shade of a very big old oak tree. I cannot get new azaleas to live there for more than a few years. Currently, I have a section um, 20 by 50 of English ivy underneath part of the shade, but want to remo remove it and plant a variety of natives without it looking wild. I have two azaleas each over 30 years old living directly by the tree along with some juniper. Um, that is a low ground cover also, the same age and younger forsythias and a holly. The whole area needs a structural overhaul, but I don't know what will live. I've heard that only shrubs that grow with the tree would do well. I don't want to compromise the tree. I need some guidance, please. Molly, I think we're all looking at you. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, this is a great, very common question. Finding natives for the shade that can compete is a um, very common issue. Uh, I actually use a lot, if you have a very specific question like this, a great resource is on um, wildflower.org. They have a native plant, um, what do they call it? The native plant database. And you can actually enter in like, I have shade, I'm looking for a shrub between this height that flowers this time. You can enter in all the criteria and it will give you native plants that fit those criteria. Um, but it sounds to me if you're wanting to go native, there's some things you might want to pull out like the Scythia and the juniper, um, depending on the holly, if it's a native holly, probably is a Chinese or Japanese. Um, but there's lots of shrubs. The issue with oaks is that they have surface roots, and so um, it's hard to get that they're all competing for the same resources. So azaleas tend to really like being up under pines because they both like acidic soil. Pines have nice, beautiful tap roots, and they have that high filtered light that comes in. And so that's just a really great marriage between the two. Um, so azaleas struggle a little bit more in different types of woodland plantings, um, but they transpire a lot. So if they're very close to a tree that's also a heavy feeder, you're, that might be an issue because they're both taking up the same nutrients and water. Um, but I would um, maybe go on the database, enter your criteria, but some that pop into my, my mind are like Durka palustris. That's one that blooms in the winter is lovely. Um, Croton in Alabama, the out of the Croton, it can handle sun, shade, wet, dry. It's just one of those native shrubs that can do it all and has incredible fall color. Um, the sweet shrub uh, is, it will suck a little bit. Itea does good in the shade, it likes moisture. Um, so there are some options for you. And there's also incredible herbaceous ground covers that you can do that don't need quite as many resources as a um, woody shrub. So there's a whole infinite num list of carexes. Um, one that's worked really well for us under some beech trees at the gardens is Car Carex cherokeensis because it can just handle all those little roots and competing. It kind of like finds its little spot that it likes under the tree roots and that's fine. Um, there's tons of ferns that you can use in the shade. Um, lobelias that bloom this time of year um, are lovely. There's a, a red one, the Cardinalis, and the Sympoletica blooms purple. So there's there's tons of options. Um, so it really depends on, I would get that structural layer down first, and then you can weave in your herbaceous elements if you're going for a native planting. And um, you are correct about not wanting to plant too close to the tree. Um, you really want to protect kind of that first 10 feet beyond really in the drip line is you want to protect those roots um, within the tree, but you're okay to plant some things. Just don't go crazy and try and plant the whole um, ring around the tree. I think it, in woodland plains, it does nice to have like a little clump of shrubs here and there. Um, I think I covered everything. <laughs> I, I was going to add, I, I love ferns and a combination of perennials like the um, the cardinal flower that you mentioned, Molly, or um, the blue cardinal flower, the red cardinal flower, all those. Uh, but uh, we, we've got great ferns in the south, the maiden hairs, the ladies, those do great up under oak trees and you don't have to go very deep. Um, and they'll, they'll kind of self-propagate so you can plant them further at the edge without damaging those roots as much and let them kind of progress in towards the tree where they're comfortable finding those those spots like you mentioned and of course I love the um, I love the Alabama croton from a conservation perspective uh, so I encourage people to try that wherever they can you're right it, it will just grow anywhere and it's a beautiful and really interesting plant and that's a good point Brooke about things that will spread and kind of find their way you might find some things that will run across the ground and then that way you know since as as they're hitting a root underground they're just going to find this they might kind of find their own way. Um, and spread for you as they want to. Um, so that might be another great strategic tactic is kind of plant them in where you can get them in the ground and let them fill in around. And one last comment I'll make on the mechanics of planting under a tree like that too, especially an oak is maybe, um, maybe don't use a shovel, maybe pick up a garden fork instead. And that can sort of help you find those places that you can plant more easily without damaging as many roots with your, with your shovel as you find them when you cut them in half, so. How can I get rid of trumpet vine? It's very invasive in my yard.
anyone? I think a, a, a brush killer, like a tordon based active ingredient would be effective on the trumpet vine. I would say, and also, um, you know, glyphosate, our Roundup, <laughs> when all else fell, is kind of your nuclear option. Um, and it's it's a fairly safe herbicide. I think it gets kind of a bad rep sometimes, but it's not something that's going to persist in the soil and, and stick around a long time after the fact. Uh, it's just going to kind of get in there quick and dirty and get the job done. But just to kind of add to that, I would make sure you get the um, concentrate of the glyphosate that Brooke mentioned, not the ready to use products. Um, you want the glyphosate um, concentrate and uh, depending on um, the circumstance, you may even want to um, cut that trumpet vine down and paint the actual concentrate immediately after cutting. Um, and I say immediately, and that's what we mean is immediately because plants have a great way of sealing that injury off. Um, and so even if you wait 30 to 45 minutes, the plant can already start that sealing process. So it's one of those things where you want to make the cut and then immediately paint that um, um, glyphosate concentrate on the cut. Uh, and, and especially if you're, um, and this applies to uh, different things. So you can use it on privet, you can use it on a lot of other invasives, but if it's more of a woody plant, um, also be sure that that surface is clean. So if you're having to use a saw, make sure you rake any sawdust off of that. Um, cut and then paint the concentrate on from there. And a trick we use in the gardens is we take um, shoe polish bottles and take the shoe polish out. You can put the glyphosate just straight in there and then you have like a little dauber to really directly get it onto the cut. Make sure to follow pesticide label on that. Well, uh, the labels of products will often have that uh, treatment method on the label. So. Also, watch your containers. I was going to say, watch your containers you use it in and watch how you dispose of it. Because we had a presentation by Sally Lee like two years ago about incidents of um, kids getting into that stuff. So you just want to be really, really safe about that. And finally, I just said, be prepared to do it again. It's probably, it's probably not going to be a one and done situation. So the next three that I have on my paper before we jump into the ones that are in chat are all about um, pests. So kudzu beetles covered my Asian long beans this year. Um, I removed probably a thousand with duct tape. What other plants should I be worried about with them? Um, what other plants should I be worried about them favoring? How can I get them to not return next season? I can take that one and then Jim or anybody else can chime in as well. Um, so unfortunately their um, host um, species that they feed on continues to expand. We thought at one point it may just be legumes, but now they will feed on other things as well. Um, they are um, a non-native uh, insect pest and um, Really, as far as I know, and like I said, others chime in, uh, there's not really anything that you can do to prevent them. Um, the only thing you can really treat them with is a contact insecticide. And honestly, that would involve spraying like all the time. Um, they are attracted to light colored structures. So especially whenever the temperatures start to drop, you may see them um, congregate on um, white or light colored, uh, whether it's your house or a garage, any kind of structures they'll be trying to get indoors. Um, so, but if you have kudzu anywhere around, they can overwinter there, um, lots of places that they can overwinter. So there's really, um, not a, a great way to prevent them. It's just trying to manage the best way you can whenever they do, uh, present themselves and I'll pitch it to other folks if they have any other ideas. I think you covered it pretty well, Bethany. I, um, I, I find that those are very, the distribution of that bug is very spotty. And I think it's, 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 it's in relation to closest places that are closest to, to kudzu patches and, and their favorite host. So if you're just unfortunate they have that nearby, that you're gonna probably get them every season. 
Um, the next question is asking for tips about squash borers. Any tips? Exclusion is a good first step um, using uh, insect netting to keep them out. And then starting with a mature, uh, not mature, but a more robust transplant so that they can withstand some insect feeding and still continue to flourish would be advisable. Also along those lines, and this is kind of a, a catch 22. So um, based on some research that I had done earlier in the year. So if you can plant your squash a little later, um, the the adult moth will have already, or the, excuse me, the larva will have already hatched out. So you don't have a, an environment for them to um, infect your squash because you're planting later. So that period has already passed, uh, but then you're more susceptible the later you plant uh, to the pickle worm. So it's kind of a, a catch 22. Um, but if squash vine um, borers tend to be an issue year after year, another means is crop rotation. So we want to make sure we're not planting in the same spot uh, we don't want to plant cucurbits, um, anything in the in the squash family or the cucurbit family um, in that area for about three years. So you want to make sure you rotate. That's a good way. And then um, kind of along what Tyler was saying too. Um, now this is not practical if you've got lots of squash plants, but you can also look at putting wrapping a barrier around the base of the stem. Uh, extending a little above the ground and a little below the ground, um, and that can help prevent uh, the larva from being able to burrow in that stem. Last thing I would add would be look for those resistant varieties too, especially, you know, if, if you know they're just, they find your garden every year, look for those varieties that can tolerate them a little better. And, and also another thing is when you have a wilted vine, don't leave it out there, take it out. And, and throw it away, get, get it out of this, the garden. And the last question from our emails are, is asking what information you all might have about the, chan the Chinese lanternfly and how close it is to us here in Alabama. We were discussing that one earlier. So the, uh, the lanternfly is mainly in the mid-Atlantic states right now, and it's Virginia is the closest that it is to Alabama. Um, it's a threat, but it's going to be a long-term threat, so it's going to take a while for it to move down from down the Appalachians and, and down into Alabama. Um, so it's one of those things to keep an eye on and watch for. And always, if you see anything, it's a pretty distinctive insect. So if you see anything that looks like it, um, you know, bring it to our attention, you know, get in touch with your local extension agent um, and, and regional agent and um, let them know what's that, what you've seen, send them a picture. I believe it was discovered in, in the Northeast by a young man who was making an enter in like a, a an entry in like a 4-H competition or something, wasn't it? So sound right so i'd say you know it definitely just keep your eyes open and and always yeah. you find a picture or collect even better if you can if you see something that looks out of the ordinary and, and get it to an extension expert for sure yeah and, and for an insect it's 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 a it's a pretty insect <laughs> you know it's 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 uh it's pretty cool looking uh yeah berks county right north of of philadelphia is where they found it first all right um, we're going to jump into questions from the Q&A and from chat. Um, Patricia Putnam says, I have a lot of Linton Rose babies. Can I mulch with mini pink bark nuggets or would pine straw be better? I I, more than the plant that it's, oh, go, go ahead, Molly. Oh, you're for, I was, well, I just have a, in Southern Living, we have so many Lenten roses and so many Lenten rose babies, and we um, pine straw, but we don't, the pine straw doesn't go up into the Lenten roses. I, I would think using bark would be the, so you don't smother them. It would be hard to kind of like, um, bark, you could kind of get it down in, like, we're not smothering the seedlings. That would be my guess, but Brooke, <laughs> I don't know what you would say. 
uh, that was something similar to what I was saying. If you can, if you can get pine straw, you know, up under them, if they're a little higher up maybe or something, I, I like to use pine straw off the paths and save, you know, the, the nugget stuff for, for paths that you're going to be walking on more so if you have both available. Um, but um, it, you know, if you have one available instead of the other, I think either would be fine just to get some mulch down. But like you said, if you, if you need to work it up under some tiny fragile plants, the smaller pieces um, and even the shredded bark might be better than the nuggets. Or even the, the kind of ground up like soil conditioner type bark, really fine. Um, Patricia also has a bay tree, which has grown to about five feet now and is a single trunk. Can she prune it? And if so, how? Do we have anyone that's well versed on pruning today? Well, I wonder if it's like the bay, like Loris Nobilis sweet bay or, or the bay, the herbal bay, or if it's a sweet bay magnolia. Um, and can you reread that? Like I, I lost, she's wanting to try to prune it into a single trunk. Is that what you said? She said it is a single trunk. Okay. So she wanted to know if she could prune it and if so, how? Um, that might be something that she might need to come in and talk to someone about. Or she can send pictures of the tree and that way we could identify it. Um, that's probably going to be the best to be able to see before we make any recommendations. Um, a lot of our trees, unless there are uh, branches that are hanging too low that are causing a safety issue or um, branches that are rubbing or you know damaged in some way, a lot of our trees really don't need any additional pruning, but it would just depend on the particular uh, plant species and the condition of it. So if we could see a picture, that would be helpful. So I'd, I'd be happy to help her out further with that. And I would just add, since, since she did specifically mention how tall the, the tree has gotten um, and that it has the one single trunk, I, I'm wondering if she might be asking about like sort of topping it, that pollarding style pruning. And I would, I would discourage that it, it kind of creates weak growth um, where that comes back. So if that's the question she's asking, I would, I would say it's not well suited to that. Yeah, um, with pruning you, it's um, what you're, they're, they're normally, there's a goal. So if you're trying to make it branch off at a certain point, or if there's um, like a stray limb or they're crossing or disease, or you, know, you need to know what your goal is for pruning it. But um, like a, a lot of times in the south, sometimes we're just in the habit of pruning things and just like having a garden task, but try and um, maybe make sure you're asking the right questions before you're snipping things because sometimes we get a little, um, a little happy with our pruners. Hold on one second, y'all. I'm reposting something that John put in the chat that I don't think everyone else can see. So just give me two seconds to do that. All right. Um, Patricia Tate says she has a succulent that has these white fuzzy places all over it. It isn't because it's too wet. If anything, it is dry. What do I need to do? What do I need to do to get rid of it? of the white fuzzy places. Is that mealybugs? It probably is. That sounds like a likely candidate. Oh, okay. um, you know, a picture would help us out tremendously and be able to just identify that pretty quick. But that's a common thing on, on succulents and some of the houseplants. Um, so you're gonna get these little fuzzy areas, but you're gonna be able to see the actual mealybugs kind of buried inside that cottony fluffy material. And there's some different ways to, to attack them. Um, you know, cleaning them off with, with soap and water and, and things like that, just mechanically trying to remove it. There's some treatments, some insecticides that we can use. Um, there's some systemic products that would really be, be very effective. And some are, are labeled for being used in uh, houseplants and things like that. Okay. But we can definitely start with a picture and get the, the you know, diagnose it right. And, and then we'll move on from there. Um, I'm going over to the chat really quick. Did anyone else want to 
add to that before I go to the chat? No? Okay. Um, Catherine said that she found powdery mildew on a black eyed Susan on the Clarence rack at Lowe's. I would think that everyone would say to leave that black eyed Susan right there um, if you're seeing some of that, some of those issues there because you're just going to take it home and you don't want it there. Um, Elizabeth Young has a question about iris root rot. Had a problem with this during the season, during this season. What needs to be done to prepare the soil for replanting next year? What about treating the roots of plants? You know, one of the things that'll cause uh, the the rhizomes or, um, to rot on, on irises, they'll get a soft rot bacteria that'll get in there. Usually it follows some kind of injury, iris borers or other things like that. And it'll be a smelly rot, um, very, very mushy. And if you find that in a bed, um, you can take some of the, the irises or and, and even save some of the 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 rhizomes and move them to another location. Um, but I wouldn't replant irises in that same bed. I would think about what other plants you could put in that bed because that, that pathogen is gonna stay in the soil. And if you replant and we get another wet summer, you'll probably get the disease to come back. So that's my rec. And coming back to the basics, Patricia said that it was an herbal bay. But um, we're still going to just tell you to bring in a picture so that they can help you with it and just email you or call you, Bethany, to see if you're here. Yeah, well, I mean, just email me a picture. I can tell a lot just from a picture like they wouldn't have to worry about coming in uh, if they didn't want to. So if, um, my email address is Bethany at aces.edu and I'm happy to help them that way. Um, Catherine Harper wants to know how soon she can transplant perennials. So I guess transplanting them from a pot after she's bought them from a plant sale, possibly. Or are you talking about moving them from a certain area, Catherine? If she's, you can, you can plant now. Um, it's honestly good for plants to have the winter to get their roots going before they're putting on all their spring growth. Um, typically I wait to, well, you, you can also divide plants now, but I basically try and not divide if something is flowering. So your later season stuff, don't try and dig those up and divide them while they're flowering. Um, that's just a lot of stress in the plant. I typically wait like pastas, I'll wait until the spring when they they start pushing, and you can kind of see their little um, leaves coming up. Um, daisies, I divide in the spring. Uh, but you can also divide things in the winter when they're more dormant. Uh, so yeah, you can get a lot done right now. I would think I can't really think of a situation where you wouldn't want to be transplanting right now. It's starting to cool off. It was still really hot. I would say wait, but we're getting lots of rain, and it's pretty cool. So. You're really just wanting to get them in the ground at a time when they're not going to, it's kind of like you're already stressing them out by putting them in a new location. So you don't want added, added stressors on top of that. So now is a great time. And she was talking about dividing them from her backyard. So I think you hit the nail on the head. Okay. Yeah. You're, you're fine to do that now with most things. Um, where was I? Kenny Anthony asks, when is the best time to trim knockout roses? Um, I would really wait until probably mid-February. That's a great time to prune a lot of our different roses. Um, now with knockouts, they can actually handle, um, you could prune then and then if you needed to prune further, they, you can prune those later into the spring and the summer. Uh, they'll handle it pretty well as long as it doesn't turn dry because they're a little tougher than some of our other roses. Um, but, you know, kind of a, a, a marker for rose pruning is Valentine's Day-ish. Um, depending on the weather. So that's um, that's a pretty good um, marker to kind of figure out exactly when. I mean, it could be a little bit later than that uh, if we have a pretty hard winter. Um, but, but I wouldn't, we really don't promote pruning anything this time of year. Um, most of our plants 
um, if not all of them are kind of moving into a dormant season. So we want them to start shutting down and any anytime you're going to that you prune, um, you're going to generate new growth. So we don't want to generate new growth before it's had time to harden off. Um, and we, that would not be the case now. So um, if you know if it if we prune and then it pushes out new growth and then we get an early freeze, you know, in in late October, then there could be some damage or dieback on the those new stems. So really don't want to encourage um, pruning anything this time of year. When is the best time to plant iris bulbs and amarillo bulbs? Did I say that right? Do you have anyone that's well versed in bulbs today? <laughs> well, most bulbs that those are um, well for iris, they're spring flowering, so you'd want to get them in the ground. You in Birmingham, you typically want to plant bulbs around Thanksgiving. Um, Amaryllis are blooming later in the season, aren't they? Um, so you could probably get away with planting those a little bit later. But bulbs, you're, it's a race between getting them in the ground soon enough to where they can get good roots going to bloom that next season. And, but you don't want them going too early and rot before they can get going. So it's kind of, or typically Thanksgiving is about the time we plant bulbs. For amaryllis, I, I think generally um, you'd wait a little bit until uh, earlier in the spring because um, they're going to bloom what, like around Mother's Day, but you're probably not going to get uh, a bloom the first year you plant them. So you may want to plant them and expect the bloom the following year, in my experience. Okay. So it looks like we need to have another bulb class. <laughs> um, Janie Ash says that she's new to houseplants and gardening in general. She loves succulents and has a, is it Kalanko Marmorata that she beheaded a few months ago. Since beheading it, it is really doing amazing. It is about nine large pups on it right now. My question is, should I remove the pups from the mother plant? or would it be okay to leave them? My biggest concern is that the leaves on the mother plant are so large that the pups at the base may not get enough sun. I also just want to leave it for fear I will do something to kill it. I might actually have to send this to our houseplant um, person if we don't have anyone here. I would say if they're if they're looking a little crowded to her uh, with most succulents, if they're starting to look a little crowded, you want to go ahead and thin them out um, and, you know, using um, just like a, a nice clean sharp blade can't, blade can't emphasize clean enough uh, to separate those pups down under the sole and then get them into a new plant or a new container. Um, if they're looking a little crowded. If they're not looking too crowded, um, maybe you just take a couple if she's worried about them not getting enough sun and then uh, leave some of the others. But if they're, if they're a little too crowded, it's not gonna hurt to spread them out. Okay. And Janie, I'm gonna copy your question and send it to the person who did our houseplant presentation this year. And hopefully she'll email you back um, this week or next week about that. Um, Sandy McCarthy says, I have a large oak leaf hydrangea that I plan to divide. Do I need to wait another month or can I go ahead and divide it now? Molly, you look like you have something you want to say. Well, I, I, don't, I guess you can divide them. I don't have any experience with that, so I don't know. <laughs> Typically, the oak leaf hydrangeas, lay, if you're wanting to just propagate, they layer really easily. You can take cuttings and root them, um, but I haven't heard of dividing them. But someone else maybe have experience with that. Um. I am actually going to send that question to David Doggett, who is one of our Jefferson County Master Gardeners, and he is big with hydrangeas, and hopefully he'll send you an email soon. Um, 
Christine Underwood had a tip for us. She said she's used this method for killing vines. Um, she tears off all the lateral branches. If the vine is large and vigorous, yes, the leaves will come back. So repeat process in three years max, the vines are so dead, they'll never return. So I'm not sure if anybody's ever tried that method before, but it worked for her. Um, I would imagine that's kind of similar to like mowing bamboo. You just get that repeated crown depletion. So you use up all its energy stores to keep regrowing those parts you're stripping off. I could see that being effective. Um, Kathy Shera said, weeds are taking over my yard. Thinking about a propane torch weed vaporizer, is this a good option for residential yards? I'd John, say check you into your neighborhood covenants, but I, I love flame weeders. I've used them more in agricultural settings than home landscapes. So I'd be, you know, really cautious about when you use it and what you use it around. Any other dry material in the area is probably going to combust as well. Um, but if you've got a controlled area where you can just go in and get the stuff where there's not much else around that you don't want to take out um, and maybe on some bare soil, watch out for mulch or anything like that. Uh, for sure, but um, I would think it could be pretty effective for spot treatment. I know um, for things like privet uh, that, that Auburn is doing a lot of research on controlling privet with fire and, and they're seeing a lot of success with it. So, um, you know, if, that, if that's what you have at your disposal, check, check neighborhood covenants and make sure you're not going to get any trouble, but uh, it could probably be pretty effective. Make sure you have a way to put out fire. So yes. <laughs> not, after, <laughs> fire not after you started the process, be prepared for fire too. Yep. The industrial fire brigade, that's a good idea to ready yeah. to put out before. <laughs> We've had some commercial equipment. We've had the leaf truck catch on fire before, and you kind of wonder, do you all have the fire extinguisher? Is it charged up, ready to go? And when that fire is burning, that's a bad time to be looking for all that. <laughs> And don't yeah. think you can control it once it starts, it started. So. Good option for hardscapes, I would think, for all those little weeds in the cracks and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's where I would try it the most. Okay. Um, Laura um, wants to know, for crop, for crop rotation, how far away does it need to be? From the house i assume because she says how far away to move she may be talking about um how far um from one spot in the garden to the next you just don't want those roots growing in the same soil so depending on how far apart and and that's a challenge i know um for folks that are growing in raised beds because your your area is so limited so um, you know, if you have multiple raised beds and obviously you can move from one bed to another as far as your plant families go, um, you know, give them the most space you can. Um, you know, if I'm planting, you know, if you're planting in an in-ground plot and you've got a row um, of squash this year, if you can move over two or three rows, that's going to be helpful. But any distance that you can give is, is better. Um, obviously, the, the further away is, is the best option, but sometimes that may not um, be doable just because of, you know, maybe sun exposure and that kind of thing. So there are a lot of other factors, um, but just the farther away, the better. And once again, um, this, if you can do it every three years, so it's not a, well, I didn't plant squash last year, so I can plant it this year. If you can go with a three-year rotation as opposed to every other year, that's going to be helpful as well. And she said, yes, exactly, when you started talking about that. Um, we are going, Jenny wants, Jenny Carroll said, you spoke about wild onion and garlic in St. Augustine. What about dollar weed and all of its runners? So what can we do to control dollar weed and all of its runners in St. Augustine grass? You might want to try for 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 dollar weed um, um, products that contain atrazine. It's safe on San Augustine, and it should be pretty effective on dollar weed. Check your labels, but um, that would be my choice. Okay, we have three more questions, y'all. We're almost done because <laughs> um, we're already at the twelve thirty mark. Um, 
We have a question from Susan Cleach. I would like to replace Nandinas in my yard with native plants. What plants can you recommend? I was going to say Molly. Well, ideally, I would like a little more information about the setting other than just that it's replacing Nandina because Nandina uh, is a pretty persistent invasive, can grow in lots of different areas. So I would, I would want to know just a little bit more about where she's putting it before trying to make a recommendation myself. And that would be a great uh, way to use the native plant database on wildflower.org is put in you know, like your sun, your moisture, um, how big you want the plants, bloom times, things like that. And you can generate a pretty good list. And we have a ton of native plants at the botanical gardens. So if you wanna come see what any of them look like, you can come see them, get some ideas. Um, Nancy Brown. I also have root rot on one patch of irises. Dr. Jacoby just said you can move the rhizomes. If I move them, do I need to treat the rhizomes in any way to prevent spreading the disease to a new area? So if you're gonna move any rhizomes and, and if you have a little bit of, of, of discoloration and decay on one portion of the rhizome, um, you can take a knife and sterilize it with bleach or uh, rubbing alcohol remove that section um, and make sure if you need to make additional cuts, make sure you're sterilizing your tools between and, and then, um, but if it's most of the rhizome is rotted, I would just toss it. Um, I wouldn't try to, to move it. And again, I, I mentioned that soft rot was one of the, the root rots that we can get in irises. And um, because the squash vine, no, not the squash vine, but borer, the iris borer is so important as far as to, you got to have that injury to get the bacteria into the, into the iris. Um, make sure that you're cleaning up the, the leaves during the end of the growing season, because that's where the, the iris borers are going to be on those dead leaves. So make sure you're just doing good sanitation. And if you have any questions or you're not sure which root rot, you know, you have or, or what disease you have, Definitely um, see if you can bring a plant sample to me up here at the Botanical Gardens and we'll diagnose it and tell you exactly which one and then we can we can give you a better recommendation. Okay. Um, Sandy McCarthy also said that her neighbor dug up all of her overcrowded daffodils several months ago and they've been stored in her garage. When should she replant them and what fertilizer should be used in the new planting? I would, I would go with the um, kind of Thanksgiving mark again, especially for daffodils and fertilizer. The gardens, we don't put any fertilizer down. I we did have um, one of our volunteers put blood meal and it attracted all the squirrels or something. They came and dug up every last one. Um, so sometimes trying to help your bulb out actually <laughs> attracts things that you don't want. So um, actually someone else probably knows the best way to fertilize your bulbs. But a lot of times if you have great soil, there's really not much more that you need to do. I'd maybe throw a little compost in with them, you know, when I'm when I'm planting, if I'm concerned about it, but, but I agree, I'd be concerned about attracting something to them. And one last question, y'all. So Patricia just came back in our Q&A box and ask, could she use atrazine for dollar weed in her flower bed? And I saw that John put in a publication for dollar weed in the chat for everyone. Yeah, definitely not. Definitely can't use atrazine. That's that's only labeled for uh, turf grasses and lawns. Um, it would, it can, it can cause problems and, and be persistent and definitely don't want to use that in flower beds. Okay. So Overside would definitely uh, have a label that would indicate the area they can be used. So turf grass, lawns versus shrub beds, uh, annuals. They usually say like annual flower perennials. And then also uh, vegetable gardens are usually a separate area on a pesticide label. So make sure you follow those accordingly. Um. I just want to share with everyone that is on the call right now that John has put
a lot of publications and different links in there for you all to look at and share based on some of the questions that you had. Um, a lot of them had to do with the landing fly and other things like that. I'm going to copy those links and have those available for your follow-up email. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for being a panelist today. I feel like we had a really diverse panel today. And um, thank y'all for answering questions the best of your abilities. Again, if you have any other questions or if your question didn't get answered here today, I'm going to send some of your questions out to outside resources that we have that did presentations for us this year and a couple of years ago. And I'm also... Um, also, if you have a question about pest disease or anything about pruning and all that stuff, be sure to send an email to our extension agents here at the gardens. Um, the emails can be found on our website, on their website, and Bethany shared hers with you earlier, but send them a picture. That's the best way for them to be able to help you, and you don't even have to leave your house to do that. <laughs> Just take a picture and send it in. So thank you, everyone, for joining if you want to log off, you can. I'm going to sit here for just a little bit longer while I copy links so I can share those with y'all. But thank y'all for joining me today. Bye, everyone.